Following the May 4th movement of 1919 in the history of China is a very uh, crucial period in the history of the country. It was a period when there was hardly any central control. It was a period when uh, foreign aggressiveness had been going on totally unchecked. And this period was also marked by two important developments. One was the birth of the CPC in 1921 and the other was the attempt at the reorganization of the Kuomintang by Sun Yat-sen. As a matter of fact, it was these two parties, the CPC and the Kuomintang, which were to play, which were destined to play uh, crucial roles uh, in the future history of China. It has been pointed out by Immanuel Su that uh, Chinese intellectuals became aware of Marxism Probably around the year 1905, when the journal Min Pao published a biography of Karl Marx, that was the beginning. And that was followed by uh, publication of other things like an introduction to the Communist Manifesto. Then we have an important work by Engels, Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State. And in the later period, of course, there was uh, Lenin's imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. Now, before that, Chinese intellectuals were more or less influenced by anarchist ideas like Bakunin, Kropotkin, Tolstoy and others. And Mao himself, he was also very much influenced by anarchist tendencies when he did not come under the influence of Marxism. The result of all these developments was a setting up of a large number of uh, study groups, Marxist Leninist study groups uh, in the cities and uh, a National University of Peking was formed, as you know, and this uh, Peking University became the hotbed of radical ideas. People like Li Te Chao, people like Chen Tu Xiu, who wrote articles, who formed uh, study circles, and uh, many articles were published in different journals which came out uh, during the May 4th movement of 1919. It was in May uh, 1920 that a pro-communist group and a uh, socialist youth group were formed in Shanghai. Chen Tusi was the undisputed leader, no doubt about it. There, in fact, Chinese intellectuals at that time were split up into three sections, three main sections. Uh, one major group consisted of liberals, uh, but they were uh, hesitant to adopt any uh, concrete or decisive program. The second group consisted of the rightists, who were definitely uh, anti-Marxist and opposed to any major change. And there was a third group, a leftist group, a radical group, uh, who apparently formed a minority, but who represented totally new ideas. And to this third group belonged at that time people like Tung Pi Wu, people like Liu Po Cheng, people like Lin Piao, Zhou Enlai, Chu Te, Cheni, all of whom joined the Communist Party of China. And of course, uh, Mao also played an important role and he also belonged to the uh, third group. It was on 1st July 1921 that the Communist Party of China was formed. It was formed secretly, no doubt. Mao Zedong became the uh, secretary of the Hunan uh, Provincial Committee of the CPC. The year 1922 uh, had been a year of workers' unrest throughout the country. And together with Lili San, Liu Shaoqi and others, Mao Zedong organized uh, the coal miners at anyone and the railway workers. And they led the workers in a series of strikes. Uh, when Mao first visited the Anyuan coal mines, he uh, formulated a method, method of study, method of analysis, which later formed the basis of uh, communist groups, basis of propaganda work among the communist groups. And Han Xuin, in a uh, very 
uh, readable, important book uh, entitled The Morning Deluge, two volumes, uh, Mao Zedong and the Chinese Revolution. Uh, there she writes that unlike other intellectuals of the earlier periods, Mao Zedong was the first to go down the coal mine and see for himself the stark reality of the living conditions of the uh, coal mine workers. Meanwhile, during that period, important uh, changes had also been taking place in the international scene. And these changes also influenced the CPC to a large extent, the policy of the CPC to a large extent. In a second Congress of the Comintern, that is the Third International, uh, held in 1920, uh, Lenin came out with a thesis, which is known as the thesis on colonial questions or colonial thesis. And there Lenin put forward uh, his arguments on the question of the alliance with bourgeois democracy in underdeveloped countries. What should be the attitude of the Communist Party in countries which were subjugated, in countries which were dependent on imperialist countries? And in his opinion, in colonies and semi-colonies, the Communist Party should enter into an alliance with the bourgeois parties. Of course, when he meant bourgeois, he meant uh, the, that section of the bourgeoisie which is opposed to imperialist domination, an alliance with the bourgeois parties. But then the Communist Party should retain their own independent initiative in their own hands. They should not merge with it. They would ally with them, but without merging with them, so that they could retain their initiative, their independent course of action in their own hands. That was Lenin's thesis, which is known as a thesis on colonial questions. Now, when the news of the thesis uh, reached the Chinese Communist Party, later, of course, in 1923, the third Congress of the CPC was held uh, in the city of Canton. And there were heated debates over what should be the policy of the Communist Party of China towards Kuomintang. Because Kuomintang represented the bourgeois party, bourgeois democratic party, led by Sun Yat-sen at that time. On this question, there were three distinct opinions. One view was represented by Chen Tuxiu. Chen Tuxiu was the first general secretary of the CPC. Chen Tuxiu believed that the Chinese revolution was a two-stage revolution. The first is the bourgeois democratic stage, followed by the socialist stage. In the stage of bourgeois democratic revolution, the leadership would be given by the bourgeoisie, and so the working class should play a very secondary role, and they should uh, rally behind the bourgeois. They should not retain any independent initiative. The initiative would be in the hands of the bourgeois. And then after the accomplishment of the bourgeois democratic revolution, the second stage, that is the stage of socialist revolution, would begin. And it was only then that the working class would come to the fore to take the leadership and give uh, leadership in the uh, socialist revolution. So Chen Tuxiu was definitely in favor of an alliance with the Kuomintang, but the leadership would be given by the Kuomintang, leadership would be given by the, would, would be given by the uh, bourgeoisie and not by the communist party or the working class. The second view was represented by Chiang Kuo-tao. According to Chiang Kuo-tao, the Kuomintang was not a progressive party. It was a reactionary party. And the Chinese revolution was not a two-stage revolution single-stage revolution, and that is a revol socialist revolution stage. And so there is no question of forging a unity, a united front with the Kuomintang. So working class should, from the beginning, exert its leadership over the movement. There was a third opinion also, which was represented by Mao and some others. Mao Zedong criticized both these standpoints. And Chen Tu Siu's standpoint was regarded as a deviation, a rightist deviation, which would lead to surrender, capitulationism, to imperialism, to Kuomintang. Chiang Kota's dev uh, deviation was regarded as a left deviation when the Chinese call something left, left, quote unquote left. They mean that it is left in appearance but right in content. And uh, and that would lead to sectarianism. So Mao proposed that 
taking the cue from Lenin's colonial thesis, it is a two-stage revolution and that in the first stage we should make alliance with the Kuomintang, but we should retain our own independent spirit. We should also extend, we should also set up our small groups, party networks, even when we were in united front with the Kuomintang. These were the three, uh, three points of view at that time. And in fact, uh, ultimately, uh, it led to the formation of the first united front between the Kuomintang and the CPC uh, from 1924 to 1927, that is the period. Now, in the international scene also during this period, uh, there were two major developments. Uh, one was the attainment of stability in the socialist Soviet Union. And the other was the temporary stability in the uh, capitalist order also. It could uh, stabilize its position also. And a period of peaceful coexistence started between the Soviet Union, between the socialist country, Soviet Union, and the capitalist world or the imperialist order. And in fact, uh, since it was a relatively peaceful period, so uh, capitalist countries could consolidate their position and started making further inroads into China uh, through their Chinese collaborators, Chinese lackeys. In the meantime, since it was a peace, relatively peaceful period, so imperialist penetration and oppression of the Chinese people went on uh, aggressively uh, inside the country. And during that period, warlordism had a phenomenal growth. The imperialist powers took advantage of the situation because there were hardly any central, central power. Uh, China was totally divided. And in this way, and it was due to th these factors that there was the exacerbation of the internal crisis in China. The social productive forces were seriously hampered and uh, repression mounted and of course, uh, anti-imperialist and anti-warlord forces also gained in strength because they started resisting foreign inroads and they also started fighting against their domestic collaborators. Now in March 1923, uh, Sun Yat-sen set up a revolutionary government in Guangdu. And by then, uh, he had already formulated his three major policies. Three major policies consisted of uh, alliance with uh, the Soviet Union, alliance with the Communist Party, and assistance to the workers and peasants. The main elements in, in these three major policies were anti-imperialism and anti-feudalism. And since the Communist Party of China had also, uh, within their program, uh, anti-imperialist and anti-feudal approach, clear approach. So there was no problem in uh, forging a united front between the two parties. That formed the basis. Both were anti-imperialist and anti-feudal. So there was no problem of forging a united front between the two. Uh, other developments also took place during that period. Uh, one was the signing of a treaty of friendship with the Soviet Union on 31st May 1924, uh, based on genuine equality and friendship. And the second was the formation of a revolutionary army. And a military academy was formed, known as the Huampua uh, Military Academy in Kuangtung. And there was a formation of the Kuangtung Revolutionary Army. Uh, these armies were formed to fight against northern warlords and to bring about the national unification of China. Now that was the goal of both, unification of the country. Of course, Sun Yat-sen's goal was throughout uh, to bring about the national unification of China. And in the Huangpua Military Academy, the CPC was represented by Chu Wenlai and uh, the Kuomintang was represented by Chiang Kai-shek. Military training was given uh, to the cadres so that an army was created and that would wipe out the northern warlords. These northern warlords, as we have pointed out, had been the main instruments of imperialist control inside China. It was on them that the foreign powers depended. 
Thus, any opposition to warlord armies implied opposition to, to imperialist control. No doubt about it. And so the revolutionary army started to march uh, from, and in, in fact, from July to December 1926, a number of provinces such as Hunan, Hupei, Fukien, Chekiang, Kiangxi, Anhui uh, fell to the revolutionary forces. And the situation became such that the whole of China was about to be unified, nationally unified, by uh, wiping out the northern warlords. But actually, it could not be accomplished in a way it was felt because dissension broke out uh, within the revolutionary camp. This was due primarily because of the death of Sun Yat-sen and after his death, Chiang Kai-shek became the leader of the Kuomintang. Chiang Kai-shek, after becoming the leader, followed a totally a policy which was uh, totally different from the policy uh, adopted by Sun Yat-sen. Uh, Chiang Kai-shek was out and out anti-communist. He was totally opposed to the policy of the United Front. And after he came to power, he uh, placed his own men, hand-picked men, to the uh, top positions, let us commander-in-chief and other top officials. To Chiang Kai-shek, foreign powers were definitely more welcome. They would rather ally with the foreign powers and fight against communists than ally with the communists to fight with the foreign powers. Despite this dissension, uh, the communists uh, did fight along with some progressive elements within the Kuomintang. So fighting had been going on. And in fact, uh, the victorious advance of the Northern Revolutionary Army, Expeditionary Army, it was also called, uh, towards the Yangtze Valley, made Hunan uh, the center of a nationwide peasant movement. Now, in fact, at that time, few people seem to be aware of the importance and potentialities of the Chinese peasantry. They all talked about the working class, not of the peasants. But this, and Chen Tusi, of course, was totally emphasized the role of the working class rather than the role of the peasantry. But despite such an attitude from the leadership of the Communist Party, peasant movement did spread. And Hunan was a center. In Hunan, uh, they formed peasant associations. And these peasant associations became the sole organ of authority in the countryside. They carried out uh, political, economic, and ideological struggles in a vigorous way. They fought against the gentry, the landlord class. They fought against patriarchal ideas and institutions, against corrupt officials, against the bad practices. And uh, they put a ban on taking grain out of the area. They effected reduction of rents, abolished exorbitant levies, and they uh, boldly freed themselves from spiritual shackles like the theocratic authority, the authority of the husband, etc. So night schools were opened, people's militia was formed in different areas uh, for self-defense. So it was in this way that peasant associations became the organ of authority in the countryside. Now Mao wrote an essay which is an essay of historical importance entitled Report of an Investigation into the Peasant Movement in Hunan in March 1927. And in fact, it was written as a reply to the criticisms both inside and outside the party, then being leveled against the peasants' revolutionary struggles. A scholar named Ho Fines, uh, in his book The Broken Wave, pointed out that Mao's message in the report had three important parts. One was the emergence of a new revolutionary situation. A new revolutionary situation had emerged in the countryside. That is the one. The second was that Mao uh, singled out a new force of the Chinese revolution, and that is the peasantry. And Mao pointed out that uh, revolution was a process of turning everything upside down. The, the people, the richer of the art, had come up with arms in hand to assert their own independence, assert their own authority against feudal forces. And the third one was that Mao adopted a changed attitude to violence. 
Uh, in a revolution, the people, the people at the top of society are, are going to be hurt. There is no doubt about it. A rural revolution is a peasant revolution uh, by which the peasantry overthrows the rule of the feudal landlord class. So violence is not to be deplored. A brief period of reign of terror, red terror, is essential. It is to be celebrated. And there is an oft-quoted statement of Mao, a revolution is not a dinner party, nor writing an essay, nor painting a picture, or doing embroidery work. A revolution is an act of insurrection by, by which one class overthrows another. So in this way, Mao radicalized the peasant movement in the fullest sense of the word. Now, it was this report which had generated a controversy, which is known as a Maoism controversy. Now, in this controversy, we have on one side people like uh, Schwarz or Fairbank, and on other side, we have Wittfogel, Jerome Chen, and others. Now, Fairbank and Schwarz uh, argue that uh, in the Hunan report, there is a uh, unique trend within the Chinese communist movement because here Mao looks to the village as the center of the revolution. In the case of the October Revolution in Russia, it was not the village but the city. It was not the peasantry but the working class. Working class plays the main role, decisive role and the leading role. And it is the industrial, industrially developed areas, developed zones, which form, form the centers of revolutionary activity. But in the case of China, it is not the city, but the countryside. It is not the working class, but the peasantry. It is not the industrially advanced zones, but the backward villages, according to these scholars. So which are more important? So the center of revolution has shifted, according to these scholars, to, to the countryside from the towns. And this is, uh, this is Mao's contribution to Marxism-Lenin. That is their argument. Wittfogel, on the other hand, argues that Mao's contribution uh, does not lie in highlighting the importance in making peasantry the leader of the revolution. Mao did not make the peasantry the, the leader of the revolution. What Mao did was that, that Mao made the peasantry the main player in the revolution, the decisive player in the revolution, but the leadership, as in the case of the October Revolution, was to be given by the working class, as in the Soviet Union. He believed that since the principal contradiction in Chinese society was between feudalism and the broad masses of the Chinese people, so that principal contradiction had to be resolved first, that had to be resolved only through an agrarian revolution. And so, and on that basis, and also, he also referred to the long tradition of peasant rebellions in China. So it was on this basis, on the basis of his study of the ground reality in China, that he highlighted the importance of the peasantry without minimizing the role of the working class. So leadership was to be given in the case of both the countries by the working class. But in China, peasantry rather than the working class would play the main and the decisive role. Whereas in the case of the Soviet Union, that role was to be played by the working class. So that was the difference. The advance of the Northern Expeditionary Army was followed by an uprising the workers in Shanghai in February 1927. And this alarmed the British, uh, Japanese and US capitalists. And they intensified their interference in China. And Chiang Kai-shek sent his own troops in April 1927 to crush the rebellion. Thousands of workers, Communist Party members, and also peasants in the countryside, they were killed, butchered. Similar massacres also took place in Nanking and Canton. Chiang set up his own government in Nanking called the Nationalist Government, consisting of right-wing Kuomintang politicians and militaries. So in 1927, there was a massacre, a large-scale massacre. And that signaled the end of the United Front uh, between the CPC and the Kuomintang. China had had the tradition of Beijing rebellions. So why is it, why is it that none before Mao had thought of organizing the peasants? No, it is not true that Mao was the first to think about organizing the peasants. Pui was there. Okay. And uh, there was uh, 
in he in Guangdong he had been organizing peasants. Mao was not well known. There were others also. Of course, Mao theorized it. No doubt about it. He theorized. Uh, he gave the theory of an agrarian revolution, anti-imperialist, anti-feudal revolution. But his ideas were also shared by uh, other people also.